Interested in taking your insider intelligence research further? Our new Analyst Access Program offers subscribers the unique opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of our comprehensive advertising forecasts, reports, and benchmarks by putting you in direct conversation with the experts who conduct the research. Book your first session now through insiderintelligence.com slash analyst access. Hello, listeners. Today is Wednesday, September 13th. Welcome to Behind the Numbers, Reimagining Retail, an eMarketer podcast. This is the show where we talk about how retail collides with every part of our lives. I'm your host, Sarah Lebo. Today's episode topic is retail media. First, let's meet today's guests. Joining me today, we have senior analyst Max Willens. Welcome back, Max. Glad to be here, Sarah. And also with us is a special guest, Advertiser Perceptions SVP of Business Intelligence, Nicole Perrin. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Sarah. Glad to be back on the pod as well. Glad to have you. Let's get started with free sample. Our Did You Know segment, where I share a fun fact, tidbit, or question. Today, it's a pop quiz. I have a feeling you both know this one, but let's see if you can pull it up from memory. So our question for today is, when Amazon was first incorporated in July of 1994, what did Jeff Bezos call it? I do not feel good about (laughs) not knowing this off the top of my head or having it in my memory banks. Likewise. I feel like you're going to know it once I say it. Amazon was originally called Kadabra. Does that ring any bells? That's right. It does. That's right. Yeah, you can just say it does. Yeah, as in abracadabra. A History Channel article I read about this said that Bezos changed the name after someone misheard it as cadaver, which I believe because I told a friend about this and she said, that sounds like cadaver. So ultimately a good choice on Bezos's part. The reason that I Googled this is someone asked me last week if I knew what Google was originally called. Do either of you know the answer to that one? Because I did not. I didn't realize that. I didn't know it wasn't originally called Google. For like a split second in 1995, when they started it, Google was called Backrub. If you that don't believe does me, not ring a bell. <laughs> I'm, fine, I'm, I'm fine admitting that does if not ring a bell. If you don't believe me, you can Backrub that. It's on Google's website. Someone told me that is like a dinner party fact. And I was like, that's not real. And it's on Google's website. They're proudly admitting this history. They can look back and laugh now. Yeah, a good vote for changing the name of your company early on. Good thing. Okay, now it's time for our next segment. Retell me this, retell me that. Where we discuss an interesting retail topic. Today's topic is retail media measurement. 87% of marketers reported that their organizations plan to maintain or increase spending on retail media in the coming year, according to Sky's State of Retail Media report. Max, You and Andrew mentioned standardization as an unlock for retail media spend when we covered this topic back in June. What does standardization really mean in this context? So I think the sort of simplest way to describe it or to to characterize it is basically allowing ad buyers to determine whether they're comparing apples or oranges or apples to apples when it comes to their spending. So there's lots of different things that could and should be standardized when it comes to buying across retail media. But I think the simplest way to think about it is a conversion window. So, you know, some retailers offer a conversion window that's just a couple of days. Some of them offer a much wider, as much as 30 days. And that disparity can create wildly different pictures of the effectiveness of the ad spending. And really for advertisers to you know, develop a very clear picture of which RMNs are driving the best results for their businesses that some measure of standardization is going to have to take place. But the absence of standardization probably isn't going to keep people on the sidelines. You know, most people have been able to figure out the power and efficacy of retail media. And so this is really about unlocking more spending rather than determining whether or not to invest in it at all. Yeah. I mean, especially because 75% of spend is going to Amazon right now, which is standard among itself. So standardization still talks about right now only 25% of the industry. Now, that could be way more of the industry with standardization, it sounds like you're saying, or is that too much of an extrapolation? Well, yeah, I mean, it is to a certain extent going to determine the pace at which Amazon's market share deteriorates. I think we 
in our recent forecast, we had that Amazon's market share peaked maybe last year and is going to kind of continue sliding as you know more investment goes into places like Walmart and elsewhere. But yeah, it's the ability of everybody else in the space to cobble together a measurement standard could kind of help jolt more spending in that direction. So what is going to, I guess, inspire everyone to cobble together that measurement standard? And Nicole, I'll go to you on this one. When are we going to see that meeting of the minds? Yeah, so it, it's a good question. And I guess I'm a little bit skeptical that we ever will, or I'm skeptical of how widespread it will ever be. You know, you and Max were just talking about the very large share of this market that's represented by Amazon as an incumbent player here. They don't really have an interest in participating in this kind of standardization. And other large players are likely to feel the same way. You know, there are other very large retailers that have been pretty successful in increasing the size of their businesses and gaining some of that market share, such as Walmart. And in many cases, these are retailers that have a longstanding relationship with advertisers who are already spending on in-store efforts that are similar to retail media. And I'm, I'm really referring to more traditional types of marketing, like shopper marketing, co-op marketing, that retailers have been partnering with their suppliers on for a long time. Those programs are themselves often not standardized in this way. And advertisers, or you know, I should say brands, are really used to working with several retailers that are their partners for selling their products and using them to buy promotions, advertising, slotting fees, and so forth. So I think there's a number of retailers that don't necessarily have a huge interest in moving towards standardization. You know, this is an area where more companies are essentially setting up new walled gardens within digital media. We've seen that happen with social platforms. We've really seen it happen with CTV and streaming platforms as well. And it's happening with retail media too. So I think that, you know, there's lots of reasons why the buy side might hope for some more cooperation and standardization there, but whether they're going to get it, I think is another question. Yeah, I think everything that Nicole just said is super on point. And I think to the extent that there is possibility for this to come about, it's going to happen when spending starts to level off at least a little. I mean, right now, everybody that's in this business, unless you're Gap, which you could argue probably shouldn't have gotten into it in the first place, everybody is just seeing their numbers point up and to the right very sharply. And when things are going in that direction, it's pretty hard to muster the you know collective will needed to say, all right, I'm going to naturally expose myself to more competition, to more pressure, to more you know margin difficulty for the greater good. Like that's a very difficult thing to sort of build a coalition around. But, you know, if you fast forward a couple of years and maybe, you know, spending begins to level off, then the urgency around that topic of conversation starts to increase a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And and I totally agree with that. I was also just going to add, you know, I think one of the interesting things about standardization, you know, Max, you mentioned attribution conversion windows, and, and that is something that advertisers would certainly like to have standardized. You know, one of the other things, though, that I thought was sort of remarkable in the Albertsons Media Collective sort of proposal for a standardization framework was when it came to the ad formats, they actually kind of acknowledged that the ad formats that are specific to retail media networks like sponsored brand videos should maintain non-standardized specs in order to continue to facilitate innovation. You know, those ad formats are the most important ones for retail media networks representing huge shares of that spend. So I think it's interesting to note that even those hoping for standardization are not necessarily thinking that it will be a totally across the board thing. And they are expecting that there still will be some really meaningful non-standard formats in the mix. Yeah, 100%. What's the motivation there? Is the idea that if you keep those video ads non-standard that they'll be like increasingly creative. Well, you don't want to expose yourself to the added competition of, you know, outstream video on a publisher website. If it all looks and feels like that, then it potentially complicates or makes the creative less tailored to the environments offered by by RMNs. And it also, too, it just exposes you to being 
lumped in with so many other different kinds of supply that it naturally drives down your CPM. So, you know, they want it to be standard, but not too standard. Okay, so Albertsons doesn't want the same exact videos that are going to be playing in Kroger. Or on the New York Times' website or on BuzzFeed. That's what they don't want. Yeah. I mean, related to what you were saying before, Max, we have omnichannel retail media ad spend in the US at $45 billion this year. But we have that increasing by double digits every year through the end of our forecast, ending in it 2027 is when that forecast ends. And we have retail media ad spend at over $100 billion. So it seems like if the buyers are willing to buy, there's not a ton of incentive for the sellers to acquiesce to things that they might want. Yeah. Right now, oil is erupting out of the ground. They're not going to disrupt or do much to disrupt it at the moment. And to your point, though, also, and just to to sort of characterize that growth, like I wrote a forecast report on this sector, and I'm pretty sure that retail media is going to grow faster than any other ad spending channel through the end of the forecast period. So just, you know, when you're talking about 20% ish growth for the next you know, four years, it's just very difficult to sort of elbow yourself into the party and go, can we add, slow down for a second to talk about standardization of ad formats? Well, it's interesting that you say that because I think that our number two, I might be wrong about this, I think it's CTV Mm -hmm. is growing second fastest to retail media. And that's another area where we're having this exact same conversation. Like, when will it be standardized? When will that unlock spend? But you're seeing that the demand is there. Yeah. Exactly right. One of the advantages of retail media is first party data available for targeting. Where is the future of targeting headed? So I think that the way I look at it, the main future of targeting and data use generally is really about data protection. And I know, you know, the conversation industry is often about privacy. And in many cases, consumer privacy is an important part of the impetus behind both the laws being passed and the decisions that companies are making. But I would say that data protection from a business standpoint is more important to these companies and that they care about their consumers. They have certainly come a long way in terms of caring about consumer privacy, but the data is super valuable to them and it becomes less valuable to them if they are sharing it far and wide, if it's leaking all over the programmatic ecosystem and so forth. So, you know, that just really goes back to my point earlier about the fact that these retailers are doing their best to set up walled gardens so that they can get the biggest benefit out of the data that they have without allowing their competitors to benefit from it as much. So I do think that the first party data will continue to be used within retail media networks for targeting as well as for measurement. I think the data clean rooms are going to be a really important part of how advertisers can unlock the most value and most understanding from their retail media buys. But in terms of what else the data can be used for, I think it's going to be quite locked down. So this explosion of partnerships between retail media networks and things like CTV, is that sort of going to come to a slow? Or are you saying more just within retail media networks, there's not going to be as much sharing? Well, I think that those deals are typically set up in some pretty stringent ways that, you know, allow both of the companies to mutually benefit from what they're doing without just opening the floodgates, you know, as had been traditionally the case in programmatic when everyone just had an identifier flying through the bid stream attached to their impression. I think what's interesting, too, though, when you talk about, I think everything Nicole said about security and leakage is is absolutely paramount. And it's going to really do a lot to shape the thinking about what kind of partnerships can be forged, you know, as lots of retailers think about offsite spending. You know, right now, most of the spending in this channel is on-site search, essentially. It's, you know, I go to Amazon, I type camping stove into the search box and there is a sponsored result up at the top for, you know, a Coleman camping stove or whatever. But there is over the next several years, billions of dollars are expected to pool into to offsite spending, you know, which goes to third party websites, which goes to social, which goes to CTV. And I think it's not inconceivable that in the next couple of years, you know, maybe a retailer that doesn't think too clearly about it could find itself in a kind of a PR bind because somebody who searches for something on, you know, a retailer's website then gets served a bunch of ads 
reflecting that search uh, while they're watching, you know, TV and see something on an ad supported streaming service in a way that really sketches them out. And because the climate around privacy is such that there's a lot more scrutiny of practices that lead to outcomes like that, I I do think that the retailers are going to have to be very careful about the kinds of partnerships they forge as they seek to drive more revenue through offsite placements. Yeah. And once again, like not a new conversation, like yes. it's happening in a new capacity, but like to what extent can you target ads without creeping people out, without creeping lawmakers out? I mean, that's the conversation we've seen with every emerging media channel. Yeah. It's especially sensitive, though, I think, given the nature of the data that we're talking about, right? You know, imagine going to a, you know, a Walmart or a Target or an Amazon, a couple, three searches, and all of a sudden you send them the data that says someone in my household is pregnant, someone in my family has diabetes, you know, Mm. I have a child with special needs. And all of a sudden, like, that's something that people just don't even think about, you know, dumping into a search box on a retailer's website. But if people start thinking, oh my God, now people know that and it's being used, even though people might not understand the the exact mechanics of it or, you know, the extent to which that data is anonymized or aggregated, it can still creep people out really quickly. And so I think that there's just kind of an added level of of sensitivity that needs to be brought to bear to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, that uh, pregnancy example, of course, is one of the like classic now quite old examples of people getting pretty freaked out by this type of data use. But I would say I definitely experience in my own life grocery loyalty leading to, you know, all kinds of retargeting out on the web and so forth. And I'm a little bit surprised that there hasn't been a little bit more questioning of it to date even. And I think there is some possibility for that going forward. Yeah. Nothing scarier than the idea that your family or roommates are essentially looking through your search history. They know I buy really expensive eggs. How expensive? I don't even know. (laughs) Um, So according to that same Sky survey, 20% of marketers are not happy with retail media's measurement capabilities and an additional 67% say they're only happy with some of the networks that they're working with. How is this impacting where brands are spending money? I think it's really only impacting it as a matter of degree. I mean, I think as Nicole pointed out earlier in this conversation, a lot of the spending that's gone on to date is, you know, born out of existing relationships. And a lot of it is endemic, right? You know, if you are a, you know, a company that sells power tools, you're going to advertise on the Home Depot's RMN. Like you're just, unless you're crazy, that's just a sensible, you know, natural place to spend your money. And so even if you think that they're you know, measurement framework is frustrating or you don't like the way that their targeting and measurement works, you still know that that's where your customers are. And so you're going to spend the money needed to, you know, get in front of them. So I think there's an argument to be made that the dissatisfaction on the buy side with where things are at might be, you know, holding maximum spend back, but it's not keeping people from spending money, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, And I mean, to that point, the stat indeed is that 67 percent are only happy with some of the networks. So they are working with ones they're not happy with. You know, one of the things that we've found a few times at Advertiser Perceptions when we've done research on retail media is that one of the major reasons advertisers use a given retail media network is because they sell products at that retailer. So like your example of a powered tool brand and Home Depot, they know that they need to be there, even if the measurement is somewhat inadequate. The other thing that I think, you know, I've found in our research, and this is something that I hear people talk about too much, but I personally think it's really interesting. I think the kind of typical line is that retail media is used for lower funnel purchases. You know, you think of the search ad, the person's in market, they click on it, they buy it, you know, that's it. But we've actually found that mid-funnel is a really important reason that advertisers are using retail media. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because the whole reason that you're buying those search keywords is so that you can be in the consideration set. So that when someone does a search, you're in the results for them to see at all. So the thing about mid-funnel is it's always been incredibly hard to measure. I think we're really used to talking about how hard it is to measure the top of the funnel. It's really hard to measure the middle of the funnel as well. So I think, you know, part of it is like, what are you comparing this to? Do advertisers have some other mid-funnel solution where they're happy with the measurement? Probably not. 
So I'm sure that they wish their measurement could be improved, but I don't know that the retail media partners are necessarily performing worse in that respect than their other partners. And again, they need to be there for consideration. They just need to be. That's a great point. I mean, search isn't necessarily like the very last step before buying something. I searched toothbrush on Amazon the other day, but that was a cursory search. I was seeing what was out there. I wasn't ready to make that purchase and I was browsing it like I would browse a catalog. Yep. And if someone wasn't in those search results, you'd just, you'd never think about them. And I still need to buy a new toothbrush. Let's keep moving. Now it's time for our next segment, Red Hot Retail. This is our guest's opportunity to give us their very specific and potentially risky predictions on a topic. The predictions can be mild, medium, spicy, or extra hot. The higher the spice level, the riskier the prediction. Our guests will tell me what spice level to expect and then share the prediction. Today, Nicole and Max are sharing four predictions for the future of retail media ad buying. So Max, why don't you start us off with a spice level and a prediction? I'm glad I get to go first because that means I get to start with a mild and inoffensive prediction, Mm. which is that the standard that gets adopted by however many RMNs adopt it is not out there yet. So with apologies to Albertsons et al., I think that what we're going to find conversation dominated by is something that just is not out there yet. And I say that largely because as we've been discussing, I think that this is something that's a ways away and being the first to sort of posit something is often does not confer much advantage. So that's that's my prediction. Okay, so I'll ask you the $100 billion question then. How will folks know when it is out there? When something gets adopted. Fair enough. Okay, Nicole, why don't you give us our next spice level, next prediction? Okay, so I'll give you a medium prediction, which is that there's going to be a big slowdown in new entrants to the retail media market. We've seen lots of retailers enter this market over the past few years, so that is going to slow down. And at the same time, I think that we're going to see smaller players and more regional players outsourcing more of these operations, whether that's to ad tech partners, to agencies, and focusing instead on their core competencies and ways that they can continue to grow profit, not only from selling ads, but by refocusing on their retail-oriented core competencies. So do you think that those smaller players, I guess, what do you think that the outsourcing organizations look like there? There's a whole bunch. Yeah, there's a bunch of partners that do this. They are, you know, sometimes agencies, sometimes they are more ad tech oriented. You know, just one example of a company that does work like this is Critio. There are all kinds of aggregators and other approaches for retailers to take so that they can get something out of advertising, but not actually have to manage it themselves. Yeah, I agree with this. I think this will be the case for in store as well. I was just talking to some folks about just like how much hardware is involved in adopting in store retail media. And I think that that definitely requires third party players to be involved. Yeah, 100%. Max, why don't you give us our next spice level, next prediction? I'm not going to go any spicier than that, but I do have a, a medium prediction, Oof. which is that, you know, one of the key players that will emerge in this conversation around measurement and standardization will be Shopify. They've been sort of, I think a lot of people have been sort of waiting for them to kind of make their way into this space. And they, for a lot of different reasons, the first being the sort of just number of merchants and potential advertisers. And, you know, in a way they potentially could help unlock a lot of inventory. They've begun forging partnerships here and there that would enable them to sort of serve as a layer for all of this. And my prediction is that, you know, as they sort of start getting more assertive about getting involved in retail media, that they could emerge as a, as a key kind of rallying point for a conversations around this stuff. Yeah, I don't think this is far off from stuff that Shopify has already done. I know I've talked on this podcast before about how much Shopify has worked with creators to sell their own products. So like they're no stranger to that like creator aspect, that advertising aspect. And so I could definitely see them sort of shifting that into, I don't know, standardization space, ad tech space. Okay, Nicole, Can you give us our final spice level and final prediction? I can, and I will. It is extra hot. So get ready. I'm ready. Max, are you ready? I hope so. Um, So my prediction is that we will eventually see something along the lines of maybe a little bit of an upfront marketplace for retail media ads. 
because we'll see suppliers pushing retailers toward offering contractually guaranteed pricing on certain ads, and they'll commit these quote unquote ad dollars as part of their existing joint business planning. You know, I mentioned earlier in the episode, and Matt talked about it as well, a lot of digital retail media spending is hand in hand with these more traditional forms of marketing. And I think that as the teams at brands kind of become less siloed, you know, as the shopper marketing people work more closely with the e-commerce or digital people, um, and also as agencies continue to kind of do their best to take on retail media as a competency for themselves, I think that we'll see, you know, the, those silos between the offline and online sides of this break down. And it seems like there's a really strong chance that will just result in this more comprehensive joint business planning between retailers and suppliers and long-term commitments of whether we still call it ad dollars or whether it it kind of returns to its previous life as non-advertising marketing spend, um, that that'll be part of, of upfront commitments. I just want this to happen just because I can imagine a future where like Joel McHale dressed as a giant mm-hmm. piece of broccoli has to run out on stage to try to butter up all the agencies to get them to spend money with Walmart. Isn't there an episode of Community where he is dressed as broccoli? No, he's a cool cat. That's an episode <laughs> of Community that exists. A little uh, podcast lore. I'm a huge Community fan, so I'd be all on board for the Joel McHale broccoli Walmart. Also, I think that, you know, we have upfronts. They're blending with new fronts already. I think that there's a lot of potential for storefronts to be the third part oh of my that gosh. season. That's a really <laughs> good name. I have to say, Max, what I think would be the funniest part is like the idea of turning the procurement people who are so involved in shopper marketing and retail media, like converting them into the agency upfront people who want to be so wind and dying to the traditional <laughs> way, like the opposite sides of marketing land. My God. Yeah, I mean, I do think that the way that we think about retailers is going to, or I mean, for you guys, I'm sure already has like transformed though, in the way that how we think about Facebook and Meta right now looks nothing like how we thought about it 15 years ago. You just like have a different sort of feeling associated with that company. I mean, that'll definitely be the case with Kroger, Albertsons, Walmart. 100%. That is my prediction. It's pretty mild. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thank you for joining me today, Nicole. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Max. Thank you, Sarah. It was fun. And a special shout out to my mom because it's her birthday today. Happy birthday, mom. One of our loyal podcast listeners. Please give us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Instagram at behind the numbers underscore podcast. Thank you to listeners and to Victoria who edits the podcast. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Reimagining Retail and eMarketer podcast. And tomorrow, join Marcus for another episode of the Behind the Numbers Daily. Come on.